Hey, everybody. It's Crystal Ann Compton. How are you doing today? I hope you are having a beautiful day wherever you are on the planet today. Before we get into today's video, I would like to ask you, don't forget to please like, comment, share, and subscribe. It really does help the channel and it helps me to stay connected to you. In today's video, I am really excited because we are going to be talking to Monica Gonzalez. Monica Gonzalez is someone who can have intentional and dynamic and crazy, crazy psychic lucid dreams. And she's been doing this all of her life, and she's going to share some of her experiences with us today. And towards the end of the broadcast, well, middle to end of the broadcast, Monica actually talks about her encounters with Arcturians. Arcturians are a type of interdimensional being, and we'll get into what they are about, but she shares with us some symbols that she's channeling from the Arcturians that help with things like creativity and with spiritual connection and physical healing. It's so fascinating. And of course, at the end of the podcast, I spring it on Monica. I ask her, what does she see for us for 2022 and beyond what's happening with this human race, this human life, this planet. And she gives us some information that we can really connect to and understand. So I just, I loved this podcast. This is, by the way, um, just the video version of my Life Magnetics podcast. If you're not subscribed or following that podcast, I would love for you to do so. It's available on all platforms, Apple, Spotify, everywhere. And I would love for you to follow me there. My podcasts are usually released in advance of anything you see on video. So if you want to be first to hear, then by all means, subscribe to that podcast. Okay, let's get into today's video with Monica Gonzalez. Well, hello, Monica. Welcome to the Life Magnetics podcast. I am so thrilled to have you here because we're going to have a really cool conversation about dreams and Arcturians and the experiences that you had in your childhood. Um, and I want to welcome everybody to the podcast. It's been a while since I've actually been able to cut an episode because I've had the Rona, right? I had the yeah. Rona. So I'm filing, I'm finally feeling froggy again. I'm feeling pretty good. And I'm <laughs> so thrilled to talk to you. Why don't we start this off by having you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who is Monica Gonzalez? Oh, million dollar question. Who is Monica? Right. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on here first and foremost. And I'm so glad that you're feeling better. Yeah, that's so important nowadays. So again, thank you. And uh, glad that we're doing this together because that was I've been looking forward to it for a while. And so about myself, um, well, I'm an intuitive channel and I work with crystals a lot. And I do a lot of lucid dreaming, which is uh, part of the reason we're here to talk about that. And I, I just love all things metaphysical, all things spiritual. I mean, I've done the intuitive intensive that you guys offer through the Light Shine Lab, and it completely changed my life. Even though I have been, you know, an intuitive psychic child or psychic since I was a child. And again, we'll talk about that. Uh, but yeah, so that that's me. I do a lot of that type of work. And I'm just here to help people in any way that I can. That's really what I want to do. I love it. I just remember you in the intensive and I just remember your smiling face and your open heart. And I'm just like, oh, I want to see what happens with this, this one, because I uh, just felt that from you. And we, uh, we also use you in one of our testimonials for the program because That's you're, right, just, yeah. yes, you're just um, so heartfelt about it. Well, why don't we take it back in the timeline to, I guess, the beginning, because like you, I was a psychic child. Every child is psychic though. Right? Every child is yeah. psychic. It's just parents need to be paying attention. If, mm -hmm. if you don't think your child is psychic, it's because you're not really looking for, right. for the evidences of it. But as yeah. a child, I was able to see energies and see nature elementals. And I had a lot of wild experiences. When for you did that kind of stuff start coming into your conscious mm -hmm. awareness and what happened? Well, to be honest, ever since I remember, like I thought this was how everybody kind of conducted themselves in life, <laughs> you know, like this is the mode of branding for everyone. This is how we're doing it. Um, so again, I was, you know, I, I, like you, I could sense energy. I could see auras. I would talk to trees. I had a lot of precognition events, which uh, kind of freaked my parents out sometimes. <laughs> to mm -hmm. be honest. Well, what did those, what did those look like? Like what kind of precognition did you have? Okay, like so sometimes it'd come in the form of dreams. Sometimes I could just, um, as a clear cognizant, it just kind of knew things would happen um, in the most random ways. And I always tell the story because it come, it kind of comes to play later on in life as well. But I, 
all of a sudden when I was a child, I must have been like, I don't know, five or six years old. And I had this knowledge, this, this, this cognition about this number. And it was a number 982. And I just, for some reason, I knew it was significant. It wasn't, you know, I had a heft to it. Like I just knew. And the number kept coming up in every sort of place in my awareness. Like I could see it in license plates. I could see it in uh, phone numbers and, and things everywhere. And I said, there's, there's something about this number that I know, you know, is significant. And so I told my mom, I go play it in the lottery. <laughs> we used to have this thing called like the pick three. Mm -hmm. And so she did. And lo and behold, she won a bunch of money. So that was one thing that I always tell because I was like, okay, this is just, this is not something that, you know, is, is, um, everybody has. And right. uh, otherwise everybody would be winning the lottery all the time. And, you know, things like that. I remember watching like soccer games with my parents and saying, so-and-so is going to score, or it's going to be a penalty shot, or it's going to be this. And, you know, 80% of the time I was, I was right in predicting that. And so, yeah, my parents sometimes would be freaking out, like, okay, what's, what's this child doing? <laughs> So yeah. how did they handle that with you um, when you were giving them evidences and they must have sensed that there's something else going right. on? With, were they scared or did they embrace it? Um, I don't think they were scared. Uh, I can't. I come from a really Catholic background and I used to go to a nun school. And so most of my conditioning actually comes from the nuns themselves, like the schooling system. My parents took me to church every Sunday up until the age of maybe 10 or 11. Uh, but they were never really forceful on the religion part. They were kind of like, well, this is kind of what we do and it is here and that's that. Um, but they were never really forceful. So they also didn't really embrace it. They weren't like, oh, let's go and explore the psychic, you know, version of you. And uh, but they kind of just let it be. And they're like, OK, well, cool. And you talk to trees. And I remember telling my mom, you know, what's that? Where are those colors around people? What what is that? And she kind of looked at me like. You can see that <laughs> and i was like yeah like what is that and i remember like she was always green my mom was always green Aww, yeah. yeah and yeah exactly right and um so she's like well that's that's the aura so she kind of gave me some of the vocabulary as well and years later like this must have been like maybe five or six years ago when i started exploring everything again she was like yeah like i have you know runes and i have tarot cards and i have this and i have crystals to give you and i was just like whoa oh, wow. like why didn't you say this before? But yeah, so they didn't wow. embrace it right away, but they, they weren't, you know, dismissive of it either. Mm -hmm. Can I just make an observation about Catholicism? Because I was raised in Pentecostalism and in kind of charismatic Christianity. And there was always the message that something was wrong with Catholicism, that they weren't real Christians. It was so ridiculous and divisive. <laughs> but then I married my second husband and he was like a cradle Catholic and he loved Catholicism. His whole family were just... they. Catholics in a very loving way. And mm -hmm. I remember, you know, taking an interest, going to mass and finding it to be actually pretty beautiful from a, from a, a Protestant type of perspective. And, and I also started looking into saints, saints like uh, Padre Pio, who had right. the stigmata and who was very clairvoyant and saints like Teresa of Avila, who was very psychic and levitated and all this, right. like there's a lot of very psychic characters in Catholicism. Yeah. So I could see how that might be complementary or at least somewhat supportive to a psychic child in yeah church. yeah it was I mean in that aspect of things were really good there was also that you know I don't want to call it negative but it was a bit of a negative experience for me that kind of turned me off this whole psychic child development to be honest because whenever you said something like I'm talking to dead people <laughs> I'm talking to trees or I'm talking they kind of look at you weird and be like oh that's blasphemy you know like don't don't embrace that and they kind of just shut it down and right isn't that so weird though because yeah. their own saints are jesus, jesus was psychic jesus jesus was psychic you read anything in the bible you're like uh <laughs> hello <laughs> right it's right there yeah okay well i just wanted to make that comment um mm -hmm. so that's cool about your parents giving you the vocabulary for it why don't we kind of continue on and, and talk about some of the more profound experiences you had at, yeah. as, a, as a child or teenager. Yeah, yeah. No, so as a child, I did, um, again, because I was a very open child and I could sense energy. I didn't really know how to protect myself properly back then. And I didn't have the tools, right? And again, because I came from this very Catholic background, I wasn't comfortable 
speaking about these things that were happening to me. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't know how I had dominion, for instance, right? And so a lot of things that were happening to me were kind of scary at the beginning. And so I would have, you know, very, very vivid dreams um, that would be very nightmare type dreams. I would have entities in my bedroom, but I know now where entities in my bedroom, right? Before I was just kind of like, what is going on? Why do I hear things? And, um, you know, I never really saw anything. I wasn't really clairvoyant in that sense. Like I, maybe it's because I shut it down. I'm not sure, but I never really saw the entities. I I felt them energetically, and I could hear them as well. Mm, okay. And Were so they talking was, to you, or was it like ambient conversation? Sometimes they would say my name, <laughs> and that mm. freaked me out. And sometimes it was just like the white noise behind it, like the ambient conversation. And I would hear breathing down my neck. I wouldn't feel the breathing. I would hear like somebody almost like whistling the breathing. That would freak me out like every single night, every single night. I would, you know, and again, the dreams, the dreams were just so vivid and so nightmarish that it's just, it was hard to deal with as a child. I was very traumatized. And um, it was actually when I learned uh, unconsciously, I guess, without actually knowing what I was doing to control the dreams that I started uh, practicing, I guess, dominion in, in that sense, because I didn't, again, I didn't have the vocabulary at that time as to what that was, but I learned that I could, for instance, pray it away. You know, I could pray and I could say, Jesus is here and, um, it would just stop. And I would learn that I could wake myself up in the dream and actually seek out answers as to why these experiences were happening to me, which I mean, thinking about it now I'm like holy Christ like I was doing a lot of you know lucid dreaming shadow work <laughs> to you sure it. were astral so do you think that's so interesting that you would kind of intuitively maybe it's all just in the energy you would mm. intuitively figure out how to deal with what was happening to you do you remember like the first couple of times you felt empowered within a dream and and how it yeah. shifted or changed the game can you yeah. describe that actually I had two experiences so first of all one of the nightmares that the, one of the recurring nightmares I had was there was a snake that was coming out of my closet. And I, I, I can remember like it was yesterday, the dream, and it was always the same snake. It was a very long yellow snake. And I was like, why? Oh, at first I was obviously freaked out as a child. Like, why is this snake coming out of my closet every single night or almost every single night? And I didn't know how to deal with it. And I guess something shifted in me and I was like, you know what, this is enough. <laughs> I'm going to ask what that snake wants. And so I purposely, I guess I set the intention then that I wanted to talk to the snake, that I didn't want to be scared anymore. And so I said um, that night, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to the snake. This is going to be the dream. Whenever it comes out of my closet, I'm going to ask it what it wants. And I don't remember if it was the first or second night or whatever night it happened, but I actually was able to communicate that to the snake. And I was like, what do you want? <laughs> Could you just leave me alone? And it actually said it wanted to help me. Oh, yeah. Which was a nice change of things. And so I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. Like, what do you want to help me with? And she's like, and I call it a she because we've interacted throughout my life ever since. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So she was like, well, your life is going to be full of transformation. And I want to help you through that every oh. step of the way. Snake, snake skin, sloughing off, right? shifting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everything just kind of like made sense. I mean, at that point I was like, well, this is cool. Like I actually have some, you know, sort of, I didn't know at the time, but it was a guide, right? It is a guide that is going to help me through uh, the scary times. And so once I realized I could do that, that's, that's kind of what, you know, empowered me to be like, okay, I have the power to do this. I have the power to, you know, control the dream or control the narrative of the dream, I guess. And, um, and so I could do this in real life as well. I must be able to do this in real life as well. And so I started praying, like, you know, get these things away from me, get, you know, the, the humming to stop, the name calling to stop, the noises to stop and the energy around me just shifted. It just shifted. I mean, it would come back, sure, sometimes, but mm -hmm. you know, I would just again implement those steps where I just pray and be like, no, that's enough. Um, so can that I was just can I just yeah. interject <laughs> because you're getting me going here. Because I've actually I made a video a few years ago about the power of the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And 
actually got some hate for it because they're like, well, this is, you're supposed to be a spiritual, why are you in the dogma? And I'm like, it doesn't really matter if you're Christian for whatever reason, there is power in that name. And yeah. I think that it's not just that name. There are other names and deities that probably work for other people who put power into it. That's it's it. really about your intention. Mm -hmm. But I've had attacks from shadow beings. I've, you know, been stuck in sleep paralysis and like, and sensing entities in my space, getting very afraid. But the moment I called the name of Jesus, even if I couldn't quite say it, because when you're in the sleep paralysis, it gets really difficult to yeah. actually say anything, right? So, but I was just trying to say that word alone. And as soon as I said it, boom, paralysis yeah. broke and everything stopped there for whatever reason. And again, I wouldn't call, I, I would call myself a mystical Christian. I believe in Jesus, but I wouldn't say I follow organized Christianity, Right. but as I believe there's power in that name and there's power in prayer to Jesus in those types of moments. So I just want to validate that for you. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And again, I didn't know it back then. It was just kind of what I was taught because again, coming from a Catholic background, right. and even though I've completely kind of, you know, void myself of religion later on in life and went more into the metaphysical things, I still use the name of Jesus whenever I need to, you know, invoke that type of energy. That type Me of, too. So yeah, hundred percent. Even if you're not Christian, there's definitely something to the name, that energy that comes with it, I guess. But yeah, so that was one. And then the second, um, I guess, experience that I have with dreaming that really put me on track for the lucid dreaming career, I suppose, <laughs> um, was completely unaware of what I was doing. But I remember I was having this dream. And I guess it's the catalyst of, like again, the lucid dreaming, because I still use that type of dream route like today. And I was having this dream where I was going to school. And I was walking to the bus stop and I had a really, 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 really heavy bag on me. And I get to the bus stop. And again, this is all a dream. And I fall on my bum. And I'm like a little girl in this dream. Like I'm, you know, again, five or six years old. And I fall on my bum and it doesn't hurt when I fall. And I said, you know, I guess in that moment I woke up because I'm like, that should have, I should have felt that, you know, if it was actually you know, in, in a wakeful state, then I would have felt that I must be dreaming. I'm in a dream. And in that moment, I woke up and I could just, you know, I decided that I wanted to get on the bus and do something else instead of going to school. <laughs> and so um, to this day, whenever I want to have a lucid dream, I put on my backpack and I walk to school and I set the intention to have that dream and I get on that bus and that bus will take me wherever I want to go in that dream. So are you saying you do that to prime, like before you mm -hmm. fall asleep, you mm -hmm. have a little meditation where you see yourself doing right. that? Wow. And does it work pretty much? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actively? I mean, there's other things that I do as well. Um, like I keep a dream journal so that, you know, I'm, I'm constantly engaging with the dreams, whether I'm lucid or not. Um, I also said if, if I want to do something specifically with that, with lucid dreaming, because I use it for many things. Then I set the intention either throughout the day or, you know, through a couple of days until it does actually uh, happen for me. Um, but yeah, that's one of the ways that I do that. Like I just, there's several ways I could do it, but I guess the way that I mostly engage with is, you know, setting myself, priming myself before sleep to have that particular dream and to get on that bus, which becomes kind of like the vessel that I use to get to wherever I want to go or to see whoever I want to see or, you know, to do whatever I want to do in that dream. Mm -hmm. So do you fall asleep as you're priming? Do you fall asleep once you get on the bus or are you still kind of awake and you just trust that you did the invocation, if you will, and it'll happen? Right. So I engage in a bit of a meditation before I go to sleep. And it's not the traditional sense of meditation, I guess, but again, you could do meditation so many different ways. But I put my body almost in a sleepful state with my mind still being conscious. And in that state, I start picturing or daydreaming, I guess you would call it, that particular dream where I'm putting on my backpack. And it's almost like, you know, because I've done it so many times, my my consciousness or my subconscious, I guess, knows already that that's where I want to go. And so it's almost like an automatic autopilot type of thing where I just, I'm putting on my backpack, so I'm going to go to that bus stop and I'm going to have a lucid dream. And so that that's a, that's actually called redreaming, and we actually learned about that in the intensive. Uh, it's a part of the mild technique, 
And that's a really effective way to Mm -hmm. get back into a dream that you had, or just to trigger a lucid dream, just by going back into a dream. Maybe you had last night that you can remember because there's like a resonance to it. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's just a a texture to an active dream. And if you redream it before you fall asleep, like you're talking about, you are much more likely to have that lucid dream. So that's so cool that you intuitively kind of figured out the process for yourself. Yeah. Well, well, continue. I want to hear about some more of these dreams oh my <laughs> and what's going on. Okay. Yeah. So um, again, I do lucid dream for a lot of things. One of the first things I started doing lucid dreaming for, I guess, consciously when I figured out that I could, you know, do so many things with it was to go see my grandma. So my grandma passed 1997. So I was like 10 years old at the time. And before she passed, my grandma was a very, um, uh, how do you call it? Like a, a lady that was very into her image and she wore a lot of jewelry and she was like very done up all the time. And um, she was also like a huge, like very intellectual and she was very spiritual. And a lot of these things I learned after she passed actually, because again, I was only 10. But I remember when she was alive, she would sit me down sometimes and be like this, you know, piece of jewelry is for this particular uh, event or this particular reason I wore it for this and that. And I always kind of found it interesting because it was a way that her and I connected. And I always liked crystals. I was always um, drawn to crystals. And a lot of her jewelry had, you know, crystals on it. And I remember just before she passed, she's like trying to tell me, oh, this piece of jewelry is going to go to so-and-so. And I guess at this point she knew she was going to pass. She she passed from cancer. And uh, she was like, you know, this piece is going to go to you. This is going to go to your cousin. This is going to blah, blah, blah. I was 10. I don't remember (laughs) where every piece of jewelry had to go. And I guess I always felt a little bit guilty because I didn't pay much attention to that, you know, that time. And I didn't know, not that anybody would listen to me like, ah, she said this had to go to this person and whatever. But I guess because of that, I started, when I started doing lucid dreaming, I was like, you know what, I'm going to go see if I could see grandma. And so I got on the bus in my dream and I went to her apartment where she used to live and there she was and she was with her jewelry and we went over everything again and we went over like all of the different types of crystals that she had on her jewelry and um again I was like slowly learning about different properties of crystals different properties of I guess I I wouldn't call them crystals back then just like the jewelry that she wore so like she had this awesome um black necklace that she used to wear and I remember she's like this is to keep the bad people away (laughs) to keep the bad energies away and things like that and of course it was like um I think it might have been obsidian that she was using and so I I that's one of the first types of um dreams that I, I remember using lucid dreaming for being like I'm gonna go talk to grandma and I'm gonna learn about crystals and lo and behold today I'm like a crystal aficionado and I, I love them so yeah that was one wow. of the things I did mm. that is so beautiful and I can really feel your heart when you talk about her it's interesting because my mother when she was living with me the last 20 years of her life, she had a connection with her mom and spirit and they had a tricky relationship. But one of the things that my uh, grandmother taught my mother was how to fold uh, fitted sheets. And my mother could just not get it right because my grandmother could just fold them perfectly, just a perfect square. Like, I can't do it. I, I, I'm just like this and I throw it in I throw it in a drawer. But my mom really wanted to do it. So she uh, intentionally asked my grandmother, again, who was in spirit, but she just audibly said, so uh, mom, teach me how to teach, how to fold these fitted sheets and went to bed that night. And she had a dream, a very lucid dream where her mother was walking her through that. It's an, it's incredible to me what happens when you simply ask, or you Mm kind of lean into wanting to have that interaction so that my mom had that. And so she started folding those sheets perfectly in the house. I didn't care (laughs) enough to follow or even watch, but isn't that neat? Yeah, no, it's amazing. And you can contact, I mean, you can go back into lucid dreaming and and to see all kinds of entities, beings. I mean, you're, you're in the astral realm, right? So anything could happen really. And, um, but yeah, but it, visitation is, it, dreams. it is different from like an out-of-body experience. Wouldn't you say, have you had an out-of-body yeah, experience? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I, I think I did. I, I don't have them often enough to be like, yeah, I do this all the time. Um, but actually, and we can talk about it in a minute when the Arcturians came, mm-hmm. I think I had an OBE or it was something like an OBE anyway. Um, 
Okay. But yeah, it's definitely different. It's definitely, it has more weight to it, the the dream, right? The dream state or what the lucid dreaming anyways, it has more heft in, in my opinion anyway. Yeah. Okay. We'll continue. Okay. So where to go next? I lost, so visitation dreams is one thing I do. And, you know, I had a friend pass away. Um, yeah, we had, this is about 12 years ago and I would, you know, after he was a very close friend. And so I would visit him also in a dream state and just like get to say things that I didn't quite get to say when he was alive and, you know, express feelings that weren't expressed. And so it's a lot of like really um, healing that happens also in the dream state that I tend to do a lot of inner child work. Uh, When I was, again, probably because of a conditioning that happened um, when I was going to school in the, in the non-school, whenever somebody misbehaved, and I guess I was a bit of a troubled child at that point, but they used to send me to the catacombs in the school. So to me, that was fine because, again, I would like hang out with dead people. I'd be like, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> right. To other kids, this is like, you know, freak them the hell out. Um. But the, the point is that, you know, you were kind of conditioned that you couldn't really mess up, that you couldn't, you had to be perfect, that you had to comply, that you had to do all these things. And, and so as an adult, I developed this kind of almost like perfectionist attitude that everything had to be right. And if it wasn't right, then, you know, I needed to be punished or I needed to feel shame. And so um, I, this was actually after the intuitive intensive, I took almost a whole year to do a bunch of just shadow work or inner child work. And I did a lot of that through lucid dreaming because I knew that was something that I could do. And so I would go back to, you know, moments in my life where I recall as a child, I was conditioned to behave this way, conditioned to believe these things, particularly from school. And I would offer love to that child and say that it's okay, that, you know, you don't need to be perfect, that, you know, you're, you know, good as you are and that things like that. And so all that love that I poured into my inner child, when I would wake up, it felt really healing for me as an adult, almost to the point that I've, you know, just, I, I, I don't consider myself a perfectionist anymore. Like I just, I am good the way that I am and I love myself for it. And, you know, that, that is a result of the, the lucid dream play that I engaged in because otherwise, I mean, there's a lot of ways you could do shadow work, but that was one that I was called to. That's something else I did. Um, there's so many things that I could do with the lucid dreaming, but yeah, visitations. Well, I wanted so, to yeah. ask you about, cause I know you mentioned the yellow snake. Does the snake have a name? You don't have to say if you don't want to. Uh, no, I don't have a name for her. I just, okay. she just sort of comes and she's come at moments in my life where that's funny. I never actually gave her a name, but she comes when there's transformation in my life, when there's change, when there's a big shift that she came when so i i was born in canada but i grew up in south america and when i was coming back to canada i she was like with me the entire journey essentially i was scared (laughs) because i was a teenager at that point and you know i was leaving all my friends behind i was just it was a big change for me and um so she was with me and i drew a lot of comfort from her in that sense she came when i had my first child she was there she was there um So I had my first child through a C-section after a long 22 hours of labor that didn't happen. Wow. (laughs) And, you know, my husband was there and as supportive as he was trying to be, the snake was there and actually (laughs) being more of a support. So so it sounds like you were conscious then. It sounds like you were not dreaming. So, But did you just feel her presence or were you able to see? I did. And she also came in my dreams before the actual birth happened. And so I knew she was going to be there, you know, and I asked her for help because I knew this was going to be a huge transformation in my life. And again, the snake had been there my entire life as long as I can remember. And so she was there. And oh, she was is... there for my second child too. It's just, yeah. So Beautiful. she comes often. Mm-hmm. Have you met any other guides or angels? Yeah. So that's oh another, God. yeah, that's another type of dream that I had. And it was funny because I actually had that recently and I, I connected my guys in other ways as well. Right. But I met one particular guy that I didn't know I had, or I didn't, you know, hadn't met him before. And this is kind of weird because the first time that he showed up, it was in a vivid dream. I, w- I wasn't lucid, but it was a very vivid dream where I was um, I was in some sort of retreat and it was like a very spiritual retreat type of thing. Maybe it was bliss. <laughs> and um, it was a very spiritual type of retreat. And I had gone there with my partner at the time. And 
um, it wasn't my husband. It was, you know, some sort of other partner that I had and in my dream. <laughs> and for some reason, this particular person was not, I knew deep inside, deep inside that it, he was not good for me. And somehow I brought him to this retreat, maybe to let him go. I don't know. And this guide who didn't know it was a guide, but this, this person, a male person showed up in my dream and I was, I felt like very drawn to him and I felt almost like a lot of love for him, even though I didn't know him, even though I didn't, you know, have any sort of connection with him yet. And he was there throughout the entirety of the dream. And in that dream, a lot of things happened, but I, essentially I was guided to go to some sort of cave where they were doing like soul paintings. And in when they painted my soul, they saw um, lilac flowers and um, that comes up afterwards as well in my conscious state <laughs> they saw lilac flowers and he was there and he was complimenting me on you know the lovely color of the soul and blah 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 and I remember as the dream was kind of coming to a close we were um uh, we were dealing with some sort of like spiritual teacher that was doing some sort of healing on everybody and the teacher comes up to us and this guide is sitting right beside me and he takes my hand and I was like okay like I wasn't I wasn't startled more as I was surprised as to to feel the amount of love that I felt for him. And um, the teacher comes up to me and he's like, are you afraid or are you in love? And then I woke up and I was like, oh. what was that? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> right? Like, this is just so bizarre. And sure enough, doing lucid dream play, I was like, I'm going to go back in there. I need to find more about this. And so I went back in, into the same dream. It kind of shifted a little bit, but that particular guide was still there like that. I think he was in a different, um, still a male body, but different look. And, but it was that energy. And again, I felt so much love to that, towards him. And so I asked lucidly, like, who are you and how do I know you? And all I heard was like soul group. I'm part of your soul group and I'm here to help you. And after that happened, I was like, okay, cool. Like you're part of my soul group. I don't know you in, you know, physical life because I, I don't, but you're here to help me and you, you're a guide for me. And so, um, I've called on him whenever I'm feeling, I feel like I don't have enough love for myself mm. or I feel like, you know, I'm way deep in the mom guilt, <laughs> or in mm -hmm. whatever type of, you know, shame I'm feeling at the time for some reason, like I call on him. And it's almost like, and I'm being shown right now, like the image of the rose quartz. It's almost like that type of energy where you just feel so much love and so much support for yourself. And so that type of guy, like I, again, I had never um, met him until like a couple of years ago, but it's helped me so much through tough times where I just like, I'm so down on myself and I'm like, I need some loving and, mm -hmm. you know, I look at my children and they're amazing and I love them and I feel love for them. But sometimes you're just so, you know, especially having young children, as I'm sure, you know, like it's just so hard. And mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes you're just like, OK, I need I need a, I need to pick me up. I need more, more self-love. And again, I work a lot with rose quartz and it's that type of energy. And so I call right. on that guide and it's almost like this outpouring of love and again, part of my soul group and. I don't even know his name, but I, I, I just go by, you know, energies and how they feel to me. And, and he shows up and so, always male, mm -hmm. always male, but he shows up in different um, bodies, I guess, uh, depending on what I'm trying to work with. And that's awesome. Yeah. I remember I met a guide in a lucid dream. Well, I met him in a dream first and I didn't, I didn't go lucid, but I remembered the dream when I woke up. I saw him again in another dream, which triggered me to go lucid. Like, why am I seeing this person again? And he had a really interesting appearance. He was very, very tall. He was dark skinned, Moorish kind of looking, but it almost looked like he had a skin condition, like oh. a strange skin condition. He was always in like a long leather duster, like a long coat down to his um, maybe calves. And he was just always in the background. And I would begin to notice him in different spaces. One day... My daughter came to me in, in the conscious waking state and she said, I saw a man in the living room by where you sit. And I said, oh, okay. And she was always doing that. So this was nothing new. It didn't startle me. I'm like, well, what did he look like? And she described this same person. 
And I was like, huh. So my mm. daughter, who was a little medium, is seeing this person in our space. And I always felt a good vibe from him. And I was not right. afraid or didn't have any strange feeling about him. But the last time I saw him was years later when my mother-in-law, uh, my the mother of my second husband, was in the process of transitioning. And I so wanted to reach out to her. And I so wanted to be there. But I couldn't because of the relationship with the second husband. And so I spent a lot of time just meditating and praying. And one night, I saw him in my dream, triggered me to go lucid. He was wearing the same thing. And then he kind of turns and he points to a table and there's my mother-in-law playing cards, which she loved to do. She loved to play cards. And so I walked over to her and I'm just so happy. I'm lucid. I'm like, oh my gosh, Irene, how are you doing? I miss you. I love you so much. And she got up from the table. She walked up to me and he kind of walked right behind her right uh, right shoulder, which I find guides to kind of hang out like right yeah. there. And he was right behind her right shoulder. And she essentially said goodbye to me and that no matter oh. what happened with her son, she would always love me and always be with me. So I had an opportunity while she was still alive, but she was almost gone mm -hmm. to say goodbye. And he facilitated that whole thing. And, and I do think in the dream state, it is easier for our guides to make an appearance, mm -hmm. to get our attention and to work with us. And I love how you call it lucid dream play and not <laughs> lucid dream work. Why is that? Um, because, I mean, I mean, that's beautiful, but first of all, uh, what you just told me. Um, but lucid dream play is because, I mean, sometimes, first of all, probably because I engaged as a child and I right. found it to be more of a game because I didn't know that you were actually, like, I was actually doing work, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but also because sometimes it can be playful. Like you could do so many things in a dream state that you wouldn't, you know, you can create whatever type of scenario you want and, you know, create characters that would play out that scenario just for you. And it almost becomes like a, a you know, a theater play almost. Right. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. So I know you're a practitioner now, you're an intuitive reader and you're very, very psychic. And you mentioned having intentional lucid dreams like you mm -hmm. set an intention do you do that for your clients do you do that mm. for what do you what do you do with that yeah so actually it was back in the intensive when I did it back in 2020 and again when you started talking about lucid dream dreaming and OBEs and astral projection I was like I do that <laughs> and I actually do that quite a lot and so we were doing the coaching and we were doing the readings you know and I was just kind of starting to get my feet wet with that and I asked you, I remember asking you, like, can you, can you do dream readings for other people? And you're like, ah, uh, yeah, like you could definitely do that. <laughs> and I remember you saying that you did that as well, whenever you wanted to get more information about a particular client. I was like, awesome. So I offer that during the intensive to some people. And I said, Hey, can I practice with some of you? And so I did a couple of those, um, in the intensive, which was amazing. And I've offered it to a few other people after that. It's not a service that I, um, offer as part of like my my practice because I find that a lot of people if they don't know that you could do this if they don't know about lucid dream dreaming or dream play they don't understand what you're doing and so they have this and I've I've, I've gotten this feedback from other people that um, they're just paying you to go to sleep <laughs> and uh -huh. so it's like well no, because there's no. a lot of work that goes into that and you know you get exhausted when you're doing uh, lucid dreaming as well like it's not you know you're not having a restful sleep right right <laughs> and so but I get I, I could see that if people are not inclined to do this type of work or if they don't know about this type of work they would see that aspect of things as opposed to you know a card reading or intuitive reading where they're like with you or an energy healing where they're with you and you're doing the work right then and there so it's not something that I've off unless it's asked you know, um, from a particular client because they know me and they know I do this type of work and then I'll gladly do it. I don't necessarily offer it to other people. Um, Interesting. That's yeah. so weird to me because if I knew, if I was going to an intuitive practitioner who did dedicated dreaming or who spent time in the astral, which is way more dynamic than just in 3D, I'd be like, absolutely yeah. add that on. I want that experience. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, some people, they just yeah. don't, they don't get it. Yeah. Have you ever had something like a shared dream where you meet up <laughs> with one of your friends or, and they remember it too? Have you ever done anything um, like that? No. So I, I tried to do that with another intuitive person. I saw us in, on a beach plane, but then when I, um, when I went in, in the conscious state and I asked her about it, she had no recollection. So I was like, I don't know 
I don't know. If I, well, I think recently. it. I think it definitely happened. Like you're mm-hmm. there lucidly with her soul, but she just doesn't have the. Yeah, she just, she yeah. didn't pull that back down into her I, waking I, reality. I think so as well. I think that's what happened. Uh, but funny that you asked that because that first dream that I had with that guide, and this is what I said: the soul thing comes after, after comes up after as well. I remember thinking at first when I didn't really know what would happen, what had happened in that dream before I went back into it, I was um, thinking maybe I met up with somebody and, you know, somebody that I know and it just, I didn't recognize them. And that's why I felt that pull, that love, that connection. And so I started Googling stuff like crazy, like, can you do mutual dreaming? (laughs) And I'm going through a bunch of information and I'm pouring over my metaphysical books. I did a degree in metaphysics and so I'm pouring out all these like the old books that I have and I found a passage and I forget that the author escapes me now but I found a passage that talked about um mutual dreaming and there was a quote from somebody and there was something like I don't remember the exact quote but it was something like a man can be in a dream state and can meet up with somebody else and they wouldn't know it Uh, but he leaves a trail of flowers of lilacs behind. And I was like, (laughs) what? Whoa. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, okay, there's something here. And so, whoa, I don't know if I actually like this, the soul person of mine, this, you know, this part of my soul group actually is here in 3d as well. And I did, you know, um, meet his soul uh, and he's living and I haven't met him yet. I don't know. What a beautiful thought though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's kind of jump forward to the Arcturians. Now the Arcturians, for anybody who don't know, they are an interdimensional civilization. Edgar Cayce, who's also known as the sleeping prophet, referred to Arcturus as the most advanced civilization in our galaxy. And when he said advanced, what he means is probably technology, but in particular spirit and heart technology and The Arcturians, in my experience, are very, very interested in facilitating and helping with the process of ascension, enlightenment, and shift, and basically bringing heaven to earth, getting 5D or fifth dimensional. And when we become refined and begin to raise our vibration to a certain degree, we are noticed by a lot of different entities and the higher we go in terms of enlightenment or expanded consciousness, the more likely we are to have encounters with Arcturians. Now that's not to say we're awesome because we're refined. I'm just saying it's part of the process of, you know, spiritual development. I have had encounters and and channeled experiences with Arcturians and I am so curious to hear how you were introduced to them. What happened? Mm -hmm. What do they do? What's going on with you and the Arcturians? So it's funny because I've heard your story and I heard it after my first experience with the Arcturians and it was very similar. So I was in bed and my husband's lying beside me, both sleeping. And I wake up and at first I was like, oh, I'm having a lucid dream, but I'm not because I'm in my body and I'm in my bed and I can't move. And mm-hmm. so I had some sort of like sleep paralysis and I noticed first I felt the energy and it didn't feel evil. It didn't feel malevolent. It felt very calming. It felt very benevolent, very loving. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go with this. And I was like, okay, so what's going on here? And I couldn't move. And I see, I, I again, I'm not hugely clairvoyant per se, but I see um, this blue entity and it's almost like a translucent blue and it's beautiful. And it has almost like a human form, but not really. It's more like the way I describe it was just like a, a, a blue light um, that kind of had like a shape, but I wasn't really, you know, um, aware of what it was, I guess, at the point. And I was like, okay, I'm kind of freaking out, but the energy is kind of cool and I'm just going to go with it. And so I was like, okay, what's happening here? And I could see them. There's two of them. I could see, um, I guess what you would call their hands. I don't even know, but they were like doing something on me, like on my body. And I always protect myself before going to sleep again, because I'm very active in my dream state. And I was like, okay, I'm good. Like, I know I have dominion. I know I'm protected and I know that I can tell them to go away if I don't want to, but the energy is pretty cool. And so they did something. And I, later on, I came to realize that it was an attunement that they were doing. And so they did that and at one point I was like okay like 
that's enough. And I didn't, I couldn't speak, uh, but it's almost like I telepathically said, no more, I'm done. And then they were done. And when I said that, I start, I felt movement in my body again. And my husband woke up. My husband woke up and he was like almost choking, like he was coughing. And I was like, that's weird. Like he was fine. He went back to sleep right away. Like, okay, whatever. Took a sip of water, went back to sleep. And I was like, what was that? And then I went to sleep again. I was like, okay, we'll figure it out in the morning, like whatever. And then of course I started, you know, pouring into the books again, started Googling stuff. And I was like, okay, this must be the Arcturians from, you know, what I gather doing all the research. But then I didn't have any other encounters with them for a long time. Then I did the intensive. Then I heard your story. And I was like, oh my God, okay, this is something like this is very, um, I'm resonating with a lot of what you're saying. And then um, obviously, you know, Kamutha. Kamutha does these lovely energy paintings. And I hope that's okay to mention here. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yes, Kamutha Lane. Yes. Yeah, she does lovely energy paintings. And so I asked her to do one for me. And when she was channeling my energy, she's like, you work with the Arcturians. And I was like, well, not recently, <laughs> but I right. think so. And she's like, well, they really want to work with you. They really want to, you know, connect. They, they want you to connect to them. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Like, that's interesting. I haven't had any more experience with them other than that one night when I woke up and they were doing something to me. <laughs> and so she's like, okay, well, maybe you need to like set the intention to actually like work with them and maybe they like, pushed them away maybe you know with when you told them to stop like that was it and I was like okay cool and so she sends me this like little energy painting and so I keep it uh on my night side table whenever I go to sleep and I meditate on it um and I set the intention that I wanted to connect with them following her advice and I was like okay like let's do this and I took a couple of tries I'm not gonna lie I took a couple of tries I didn't really know what to expect I didn't really know how to pry myself to it I didn't know what I was getting into essentially but then I started connecting with them in my dream state and so they would come to me in my dreams and they don't always come as that blue mm -hmm. translucent being that I saw near my bed uh, sometimes they come the latest they came in like the form of blue huge blue butterflies and I knew it was oh, them wow. yeah oh, wow that's yeah. striking okay it was it was it was a little startling because that was the first time they came as butterflies, so they sent a bunch. And I was like, "What's happening?" <laughs> um, but anyway, and what we're doing together, and again, this is it takes a lot of work, as you know, to be in that state, and it's really exhausting. So I don't always do it, but when I do dedicate the time and the intention to do it, what they do with me is they give me symbols. They give me these like sacred geometry overlays is what i would call them because they have a bunch of different um sacred geometry symbols that are again overlaid together and they mean separate things they're different things for each symbol so they've given me so far a symbol for like um almost like a spiritual activation which is probably one of my favorites to be honest and it's like it's got a blue like a darkish blue background and it's got um the flower of life almost in like a gold color embedded on it and then it's got the six pointed star and then it's got like on top of the flower of life and then it's got like a spiral of lights like a very um like very 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 bright yellow lights that are coming out of the center and wow. getting bigger as they expand outwards and they said that's a symbol for activation use that whenever you are helping clients whenever you're helping people attune to their gifts I was like, okay, so what do you do with this? <laughs> like, what right. do you do with it? How do you uh, use it? Yeah, right. Like, okay, here's a picture. Like, okay, cool. And like, I'm not, I'm artistic enough, but I don't think that I'm, um, you know, I have the talent to draw that out as they showed it to me. And so I'm using things like, I'm still kind of playing around with it, but I'm using like Canva and things like that to kind of do the overlays. And they kind of look like what they showed me. So that's a step forward. Uh, but essentially they said like either, you know, you can meditate with these symbols, you can use them to project their energy out in healing, you can use crystals to make grids on them. And um, so I do a lot of crystal healing as well. And so uh, one way that I do it is to create a grid for the person that I'm working with. And I project that energy onto them. So they told me that I could do that as well. 
with the symbols. So they've given me that one. They've given me one for creativity. They've given me one for communication. They've given me one for um, sleep. There was, there was another one. And then they said that the next, I guess, said telepathically, I don't even know. I just kind of have this knowing that comes uh, that they want to work with me on on healing through um, with these symbols, but also healing almost in like like physical healing, but in the dream state with myself and with other people. And okay, so I guess so you would go intentionally into a lucid dream for someone else and work with these symbols in that state. I am so excited right now. I can't stand it. <laughs> I'm like, I want to see all of the symbols. I would like you to give me some of these symbols. I want a symbol. I want a creativity symbol. Like, oh my gosh. Oh my God, yeah. And I can also see this as cards too, like oh, having Arcturian wow. activation cards. And you could work with an artist, somebody like Kamutha, and there are That's tons of true. artists out there. Create these cards for people with along with some sort of a practice or a technique in order to invoke or charge or whatever the process is you would tell us. And I think people could use these. Yeah, you know, not that's to a great idea. Not to marketize everything or monetize no. everything, but like to get it out to more people. Exactly. Who in their space and yeah, amazing. Okay, I interrupted you. Go on. So no, no, I mean that's fine. No, they're, um, they're you mentioned about symbols coming in. Additional symbols coming in for you. Yeah. So again, I guess that whenever that first encounter happened with them, and I told them that I kind of had enough, I've set the intention that I will be the one. Hmm. to kind of, you know, not control, but like say when I want to do this and Manage not just it, like, right. yeah, exactly. Not just show up whenever you want to show up and like, let's do this. And so sometimes I get the nudge though, that they want to do this again, those, like those butterflies that they sent, they sent a bunch. I mean, my house was being inundated with butterflies. I was like, okay, I get it. Like <laughs> you want to do this again. And so it's just about setting the intention and actually dedicating the time to do that type of dream work and so what they've told me I guess again telepathically is that they want to attune me or teach me or do something with me so that I can use these symbols and whatever else they want to give me to heal and not just to like energy I mean everything's energy as you know but not just spiritual healing but also like physical healing in that particular dream state mm -hmm. through the use of these symbols and whatever else I want to you know teach me. <laughs> so that's what I'm currently working on. So we'll see. We'll wow. See how that goes. Yeah. That's amazing. I get really excited just thinking about that. And yeah, and that's the thing. And, and we discussed this in the uh, intensive about interdimensionals is that they don't have, they've never been embodied as a human being. So they don't have to like sleep and poop and eat and all right. the things that we have to do to just be alive. <laughs> so they don't have a sensitivity for necessarily for how our scheduling works and mm. we can't just work and channel and, you know, create symbols 24 yeah. seven, like we've got to go to bed and stuff. But I have found in my work with interdimensionals that all I really have to do is set the intention and be the manager of the experience and give them business hours and they will comply. They yeah. will comply. Yeah. Absolutely. They, they want to get the work done. They need people like you. They need people like me who are willing to work with them to facilitate what we're in process of right now on earth. So exactly. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really excited. And I will definitely send you some of these symbols. Like I, symbol. I want to, to yes. And if there's something I need to do in specific, if there's a ritual or if yeah. there's something, let me know because I would like to try that out and definitely yeah, very intrigued by it. You know what you could do with the creativity symbol? And I, I'm going to try my best to describe it, but <laughs> it's essentially like um, it's got a an orange, like a pale orange background. And it's got a very bright um, yellow center, like almost like a circle. And then I don't know if you've seen like the the, the symbol or like how an atom is usually drawn with the spir with the spirals mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. like ellipses. And so it's got some of those uh, that they're all connect to the seed of life um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. sacred geometry. And the, it's a very like cool mix of orange and yellow. And I guess that's again working with the creativity chakra and also the solar right. plexus for the will. And so what they've shown me for that one, not only to create it, but they've also coupled it with some crystals to lay it on as a grid yeah. and setting the intention for whatever it is that you want to create in your life. So yeah, that's really, really cool. That's, that's so what kind of crystals like orange, yellow? Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. So citrine. you would use citrine, okay. definitely citrine, mm -hmm. carnelian. You could use something like, again, depending on what you want to manifest, but like 
the major manifestors, I guess, citrine, any sort of secret crystal to be the centerpiece, so a quartz. And I love working with citrine because it's a very, very positive stone and it's a very, um, it's a manifestation stone. And so I would put citrine in the center of that with mm -hmm. the intention. And I always say this to people, like, make sure that you're programming your crystals to hold that intention. And so what I do is I sit with it for like, you know, half an hour, meditate with it and really transmit that intention onto the crystal. And I also journal about what I want to accomplish, what I want to manifest. And then I take a little bit of that piece of journal and I write, you know, a small intention drawn, withdrawn from that, that, that journal entry. And I put it under the crystal on the grid and then I couple it with other crystals. So like I could use, okay, depending on what you want to manifest, but it, right now I'm using it uh, with citrine pirate, Pirate and Citrine are like a match made in heaven. They go so well together. And like Pirate is a very, it's like a male stone, male energy stone. So it's got like this like action oriented energy mm -hmm, almost. Mm -hmm. Like it's just like a very, you know, I'll go out into uni the universe and get whatever you're trying to mm -hmm, manifest for mm -hmm. you. So coupling that up with Citrine is amazing. Also clear quartz. Mm -hmm. clear quartz will amplify all of the crystals and your intention. And so I use clear quartz points on that particular grid and I point it inwardly to the citrine mm -hmm. so that it attracts it to me, to whatever it is that I'm trying to manifest and carnelian, like little pieces of carnelian to spur that creativity. Do you think you'd be able to make available to the listeners um, an image of this or something yeah. downloadable? You could send it to me. I can put it on my website sure. and I could put it, make a page. If, if so, then yeah, we can get them because you've just given us the instructions for it as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can, I have the, like, I'll, what I could do is I could do this. I could send you the image of the, the symbol, the grid, yes. and mm -hmm. I'll send you a separate symbol, a separate grid picture mm -hmm. with the crystals. Okay. Overlay. Yeah. If you send that in, then I will um, upload that to my website and I'll drop a link in the podcast description or the YouTube description, wherever you're watching this awesome. for people to go in and go ahead and get a copy of that and yeah. a look at that grid because everybody wants to manifest some beautiful right. conditions for their life. That's what it's all about. Yeah. I did want to just add that I, that it's, it's absolutely in alignment that the Arcturians are working with sacred geometry. Sacred geometry is uh, the domain of the sixth dimension. And that's where I find the Arcturians as well as some Pleiadians. Mm -hmm. But the Arcturians work with the technology. And yeah. in order for anything to be outpictured materially in the third dimension, our dimension, Earth, it has to first be created in the sixth dimension the sixth and then day. pulled down mm -hmm. through people like you who are inspired by it. And now you're externalizing the symbol, making mm -hmm. it available for other people and now other people can use this technology. So it's yeah. super sixth dimensional and cool. <laughs> I, I think know, it's it so exciting. Really cool. So where do you see yourself going with the Arcturians and how is this going to be informing your work, your clients and things of that yeah. nature? So like I said, they want to, they want to teach me, I guess they yeah. want to work with me in terms of how to do certain particular kinds of healing. Like again, I do crystal healing right now a lot. And so maybe it's incorporating some of that with the sacred geometry symbols that they're giving me for specific ailments, for specific conditions, because they made it very clear. Like I do a lot of, I guess, spiritual healing, energy healing, but they want to really work on the physical aspect mm -hmm. as well. Thank and you. Everything is energy. Everything Thank you, Arcturians. We need <laughs> right. some help in the physical. Yeah. So we'll see where that goes, but that's really what I'm focused on right now um, in my work with them. And continue with the crystal healing, continue, you know, making yeah. these symbols available to people and hopefully helping someone or other. <laughs> well, maybe you can come back and talk a little bit more about crystals and just yeah. give us some information about that because I know people sure. love that. And I have obviously some knowledge of crystals, but like I'm not a crystal aficionado as, as you are, <laughs> or like, you know, putting them all together for different things, different mm -hmm. types of healing, different types of manifestation, different types of energy. Yeah. If you ever want to come back, I know we would love to hear from you. I'd love to, yeah. Now, I'm going to spring this on you. I have been asking folks who have been coming on what they're sensing and feeling about 2022 into 2023. Obviously, the world right now, is it appears to be not so, but I mean, as within, so without. So if it's mm -hmm. not so, something's going on inside of you, you got to look at. But, mm -hmm. you know, people are very curious about where we're going and what's happening. We're at such an interesting 
crossroads. Like we could go this way into yeah. uh, capitalistic corporate AI Mark Zuckerberg land, or we could go in this way into heart activation, unity consciousness. And it feels like we're going towards <laughs> Zuckerberg AI, but what do you think? And is there anything that you've been picking up about yeah. what's coming for us as a collective? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that the past two years have been really, really difficult for people in many ways, but it's also given us an opportunity to be more introspective. And it's given us an opportunity to really be able to look within again to and maybe not all of us, but a lot of us uh, have really dedicated the time to see how we can make our lives better and other people's lives better. And so I think there's still a lot of work, a lot of work to be done. I think this year is going to be one of healing. I don't think that we're going to see a lot of stark shifts, so to speak, right now. I think that's still going to be a couple of years. I'd say two more years, maybe two or three more years. But I think this is the year where it's going to be start to bring balance into our lives. And so I'm not going to say we're going to go, you know, route A or route B, but I think this year is going to be one of healing, of really understanding where we need to go as a human race, because obviously what we've done up to now is crumbling. And I think anybody who looks outside can see that everything that's happening in the world, something's coming, a shift is coming. We have to change in some way. And so I want to be optimistic and say, we're going to go the way of, you know, the heart healing <laughs> route. And I think a lot of us are pushing in that direction and trying to make, you know, things like this available to people so that we, as a collective, we, you know, shift that way. Uh, but there's still a lot of healing that needs to be done. There's still a lot of people that need to um, come together, I guess, as a community. And I see that a lot of people are doing that, but there's still a lot of division in the world. And so I think, like I said, there's still a few years of healing, a few years of trying to understand each other, a few years of really coming together as a collective. But once we learn to do that, I think that we're going to go more of the heart sector healing way. At least that's my hope. <laughs> does it feel like the timelines keep flip-flopping? Because it does with me. Like sometimes I'll check in and it's like, oh, here we go. Heart activation, heart chakra for the planet. We're we're there. We're getting it. Or we're hooked into it at least. We've, mm -hmm. We're becoming aware. And then I'll check in, you know, a week later. And, Ooh, AI, Mark Zuckerberg, we're, we're, we're switching. We're, and it's so responsive to the consciousness, which is why I think it is important to get so intentional about what you're feeding your mind mm -hmm. and your heart and your soul, because as a man thinks, so he is. And mm -hmm. a lot of what's happening on the planet is because we are creating it to happen in this way. Of all of what's happening on the planet Everything, is because yeah. <laughs> we are creating it and we're not, we're reacting, we're not being intentional. When you look up, and I think people are, worried about things like inflation, which is very scary, mm -hmm. you know, right now, yeah. Canadian trucker convoys and things yeah. like that. Just the disruption that's happening right now when we're filming this and when we're recording this, there just seems to be the uh, Russia, Ukraine, there seems that's to just be so a lot much. of things. But I, I don't know, Monica, like, underneath that, and just above that, I feel very peaceful. And I do feel like that's that's what's available. Well, that's who we are. Underneath it is who we are. We're connected to love and we're connected to one another, whether we like it or not. I am you and you are me and, and we're together. Uh -huh. yeah. And above that, it's what it's what's trying to be drawn down into the reality. It's what's asking to be manifested. The more up we go with our love of and who we are, the more this comes into the reality. It's just the questions like, are we going to do it? Yeah. Are we going to keep the course or are we going to start reacting to all the crazy stuff that's happening in the planet and just create more of it? It's, yeah. it's kind of a, if you look at it from a soul perspective, my dear, it's kind of a fun time to be alive. Like, okay, yeah. well, what are we creating? <laughs> what humanity? are we doing here? Yeah. yeah. What are we doing as souls? But I guess hundred we'll percent. I always say, you know, nobody, at least I've never met anybody that consciously wakes up and say, I'm going to do evil today. I think that, and again, I'm not trying to justify anybody's actions or anything of the sort. I'm just trying to offer some understanding as to the actions of people and what's happening in the world. And I think people wake up and literally try to do what is in their interest. And that may take on very different forms for everybody, right? But if we at least try to make an effort to understand that and to heal whatever it is that, you know, that's where that's coming from as in, and what we're manifesting and why we're manifesting that. I think we're going to be a little bit closer to going to that heart centered 
healing way, you know, just offering some understanding and compassion for others and really trying to heal because <laughs> I think that's so important. <laughs> and it's available. Yeah. It's available. We really, we mm -hmm. just have to move in the direction of that. Well, all right, Monica, it has been so wonderful, truly to talk with you and to hear your experiences. And the thing I love about you is that you are emblematic of what is actual and what is possible. And what I mean by that is like, as a child, you were connected to the world of spirit. You were seeing auras, you were interacting with energy and it was so natural. You were having these beautiful dreams. And that's because humans in general, we are connected and we are psychic. And I think you're also emblematic of what is possible because you didn't turn that off maybe for a period of time, it went dormant a little bit, you didn't turn it off and you're leaning into who it is you truly are and what you have access to. And because of that, you are having interactions with interdimensionals. You are doing profound healing work. You're getting downloads with these Arcturian symbols. And that is so awesome. <laughs> and I just wanted to ask you, is there any way for people to find you if somebody wanted to book a reading and ask, and if I were you, I would ask Monica to please dream in a dedicated way on my behalf, because I would want to know what spirit has for me. So if somebody is out here wanting to reach you, how could they do that? Sure. Yeah. I'd be more than happy. Uh, you can reach me on my Facebook page, which is Soulful Magic. And there it is. Yep. And you can contact me through there until I actually have a website up and running. But, you know, just send me a message and I'll be happy to to connect with you. And thank you so much, Crystal. This has oh, really absolutely. been so, so much fun. I love oh. talking to you on any day. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that we got to do this for an hour is amazing. Thank so you. awesome. And I really do mean it. I hope you can come back because I think the people will love it. All right. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you, thank everybody, you. for watching and listening. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Support the Life Magnetics family and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody.